Sounds good, Linda. And we're going to be doing an event in uh, Ashland on August 15th. Awesome. So if you want to put that into your calendar, the band will be playing and we'll be ha we'll have our booths there. Awesome. Our, our interactive uh, hemp booth where we have a lot of materials for people to uh, learn about uh, hemp and, and uh, what the end product can actually look like. Cool. Cool. What are your thoughts on the hemp industry? I mean, it's kind of a different time right now. There's really no background industrial or wise since the, what, the 50s? So I'm kind of curious to get a finger on the pulse here. You, I guess, open-ended question, what, is, what does hemp mean to you? Sure. Um, I'll just start talking a little bit about um, Hempster Project Heart. Our mission as a nonprofit is to raise consciousness about the benefits of hemp for um, land-based people, to um, support um, localized industry for like a healthier kind of population and people. Um, so it's kind of like a perspective on hemp that is more of like a holistic, we look at it like earth medicine, um, that hemp can help rebuild the soil and um, yep. also have economies that aren't gonna you know hurt the planet. So that's some of kind of our philosophy as just hence the Project Heart. Um, we're a project of Earth Island Institute based out of Berkeley. So the majority of events that we do are in California. Um, and personally, I've been doing this for a few years. Um, I've done some research up in Canada. Um, I went to Humboldt State. And I um, have been volunteering with Hempstead Project Heart for a couple of years now, and I've been working um, with the hemp industry through the Hemp Industries Association, as well as Vote Hemp, um, doing different projects on, like, you know, basically grassroots organizing to just help people become aware of hemp, um, bringing it into their radar. Nice. So that's a little about, bit about me. This is Linda here, and I've been involved with HEP uh, probably around, I think it was two, I met John at the end of 2012, and um, got together with him in 2013 to start doing events together so we could uh, promote HEP. And I really didn't know a whole lot about hemp, but I did know it as as a fiber that was made illegal for reasons that uh, didn't make sense to most people and only benefited very few for it to be made illegal. And so now, as I've learned more, and uh, I have a background in green building. Nice. And that really interested me in hemp because hemp can, is, is useful for green building because it has great value in uh, structurally and it's uh, flame retardant and mold retardant and, uh, and it, it, it's breathable. So in, in indoor air quality is, is you know, what I'm looking for in a building material. Yeah. And so started getting uh, interested in that, and uh, we've been directing uh, our attention towards the green building community. And sometimes we have John come and be with us, especially if we're on a panel, to where uh, several people can discuss the discuss discuss hemp from different angles. And we also show a film. We have a relationship with the director of a film called Bringing It Home, and we show this film to a variety of people, and, and, but it's pretty much focused on the building community because it really talks about uh, hemp as a building material as being a really great financial uh, boom for America. Mm -hmm. And so... And so that's pretty much how I got involved and uh, participated in 
the uh, organizing and producing of a variety of different events that we do and have done. And next month, we'll be uh, at the California Straw Bale Association uh, conference in Sonoma County here in California. And uh, we're going to have a booth there. They invited us to come and be there because Hemp and Straw Bale work together very well. And so uh, everybody's looking at building materials that can be sourced locally yep. and uh, produced without harm to the environment, yep. or at least the people that are interested in what we're doing. And of course, there are the people in the, who are looking at hemp in other ways that is good for automobile industry and for producing clothing and fiber and food, etc. In our booth, we have samples of hemp for all of those different industries, nice. and that's why we're we're building up our uh, our ourselves to go around and uh, bring our traveling roadshow basically with us to different uh, conferences. That's great. That's great. Nice. Um, you, are you ladies familiar with the triple bottom line? If, Economics, uh-huh. and equity, um, environment, and it looks like Kemp does have a lot of potential for meeting all three of those. It, would you have any comments on something like that? Like the you're talking about the holistic whole look view. Uh, I'm kind of interested about what Hemp can probably do for perhaps equality. Do you have any comments on that or quality? You mean quality of life or quality of building materials or clothing or food or... Or, or a, a equality. You know, I, I, I guess where I'm going with the question is that there is a lot of financial potential for this, but is there any recommendations in terms of like, say, a cooperative business model or some sort of community building oh, model, yeah. a, a transition town? I, I guess that's... uh uh-huh. Yeah, I mean, the thing is to bring the economy to the people so that, you know, you're familiar with Hemp History Week, and it's let American farmers grow hemp. So we're talking about having having that rather than industrial farming, that you want to get its hands on hemp seed and pollute it and genetically modify it, that, you know, small farmers can actually create a collective as they have in the past to grow hemp. And, you know, the thing is, and then what? You need processing plants. And yes. how close to the farm would you say that every, isn't there like processing plants every couple of hundred miles that the farmers would be able to take their, their, uh, buy their, their stocks to and their seeds, etc.? Well, ideally for <laughs> processing hemp fiber, bales of fiber, you would want to do that within 100 miles of where it's grown just because of the economics involved with the transporting this really heavy material um, if you want to actually make it like a sustainable model. Okay. Um, but yeah, ideally uh, hemp would function really nicely under a cooperative model. Uh, you know, you'd have the regional farmers kind of cluster together where the hemp is going to be grown and then you have your processing and then your local industries or businesses that will contract the material and the seed, the fiber and the seed. Yeah, and they did that in the Parkland region up in Manitoba when in 1998 they started growing hemp again. Um, The farmers had to figure out how to adapt the farming equipment to harvest the hemp. And so they had to do a lot of their own kind of research development, kind of entrepreneurial work. And so they farmed, uh, they formed the Parkland Industrial Hemp Growers Mm Co-op. And through this co-op, the farmers would share information freely with one another on what worked, what didn't. They also worked with the local and provincial government to do projects to breed hemp varieties that were suitable for their region because they had to nice. pretty much start from scratch. Right. Um, and so farmers are going to benefit from the experience of the Canadian farmers and 
then also there's going to be a lot of work that's going to need to be done at the regional level um, to, you know, for example, start develop planting seed, um, breeding for their area, um, and also we're in a unique situation in, in Oregon and, you know, California and the states where we have a lot of marijuana production is that there's going to have to be some sort of cooperative model between the marijuana industry and the hemp industry for zoning and mm-hmm. for uh, managing the pollen transfer of hemp. Yep. Um, because we know that, you know, hemp and marijuana, they're both cannabis sativa and they're interrelated. So that's going to be half that's going to have to be managed. And in Canada, you can kind of look at their model of, they have their different categories of hemp, um, hemp seed. And you have, for example, foundation seed and like certified seed. And I think for foundation seed, you have to have the hemp field separated by like a couple miles. So you can deal with like the genetic transfer of pollen, that way they're not getting cross contaminated. And I think for certified, it's like 500 feet, you know, like 1,000 feet or something. Um, but they do a lot of stuff genetic, I think, slow. But that's like in of itself an example of like just the amount of work that it's going to take to look at that exact issue just in of itself. And right. then you have all the other things to be developed. Um so there's a lot of opportunity for research to happen. So it's great, you know, that you're working on this too. And um, so there's a lot of research that needs to go on and also just developing the processing and manufacturing. Um, so. Cool. Cool. Yeah, I, I, I've been trying to follow along localized wool growing too because it's kind of in the same, same game in terms of clo- clothing production. Um, and it, it doesn't sound like they've necessarily figured out the infrastructure, the logistics of what it, where it goes once it gets out of the field per se. And um, definitely some questions to ask there. But 100 miles—that's a, that's a interesting number there. <laughs> okay. Um, so are you? Um, go ahead. It was. Uh, it was actually um, two. It was. Uh, let's see. It wasn't 100 miles. For, I think foundation seed they separated by like two of miles but some people say just in general like a good number is like five or six miles that you'll want to have the silk separated from one another oh I see marijuana and hemp yeah and then um, there's certain filters that indoor growers can put on to their grow rooms to keep it from getting in mm-hmm. um, but in places like Oregon where you have outdoor marijuana production happening then there's going to have to be some cooperation between between industries per se oh, okay yeah okay some, some people say nine miles five to nine miles i mean okay. i don't know if anybody really knows yet because it hasn't been happening but you know it depends on where how strong the limbs are right um, do you, do you have a estimation on how things are moving along here? Is this going to unroll over the next couple of years, next 10 years? Uh, any thoughts on that? Well, you know, California is a marijuana-loving state. You know, we've been in industry for quite some time here, and hemp has not had the industry here like it has in Wisconsin or Kentucky or Virginia, you know, um, and other states like that. Hemp has a long history there, long history, I mean, hundreds of years. Whereas in um, California, you know, marijuana has been a pretty strong industry too. Not that long, but we, uh, you know, we we have a, a, a solid reputation as a great producer of marijuana. Right. So... Um, you know, I, I think that right now we have to write the rules ourselves, you know, people, the economy is just going to write it itself. You know, what is the best region to grow whatever, you know, what does it look like, you know, where, where would have grow best in California? I mean, if some people say it would be way south, you know, and 
not up north. And some people say it can be in the Central Valley, you know, um, based on the fact that California is running out of water. You know, it's like it, 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 it's all a game changer. You know, the hemp needs water. It doesn't need, need as much as cotton, but, it, nope. it, you know, it's not a cactus. It needs water. So yeah. people are going to be looking at that. Yep. Okay. So, uh, in terms of how quickly it's running, it's moving, um, you know, there are some states that are putting uh, the pedal to the metal way sooner, faster than California is. You know, states like Kentucky and Virginia, and I believe Oregon, too. What do you have to say about that, Anna? Um, my understanding with Oregon is that it is legal to grow hemp, and they are giving out licenses, but there's one guy, Edgar Winters, in southern Oregon that got a license, but the issue is acquiring planting seed. Mm -hmm. um, and so basically just an overview of the political situation. So hemp is not legal at the federal level to farm commercially. It's legal at the federal level through the Farm Bill for research, and that's in states where the states have legislation that allow hemp research. Okay. And so there's like over 20 states where that is the case. Um, so uh, Colorado is an exception in that they are doing some commercial production, um, trying to build local industry, and they have just gotten the green light through Colorado to not have to wait for federal permission to do commercial, but most of the states that are growing hemp right now, such as Kentucky, they are working through the Farm Bill, and that's for research only, and uh, Kentucky did go through some issues being planting seeds. They had it held up by the DEA, but finally they got it turned over, but they do have some like high-profile political support in Kentucky, like Rand Paul, Mitch McConnell. Um, so it is totally bipartisan. Republicans and Democrats are in support of hemp. Um, folks like Vote Hemp, that's a good website to check out for just legislative information. Um, so that's votehemp.com. Okay. And you can click on any state. It will tell you what the laws are. Cool. And uh, let's see, where was I going with that? So Wisconsin, it's, they have a lot of hemp legislation in place, so they're positioned really well. Um, let's see. And so the question that you were asking, I'm kind of lost in the question. But basically that's kind of an overview of the political situation. And um, there is the Industrial Hemp Farming Act, and that was introduced um, by Rand Paul, and that at the federal level would define industrial hemp and amend the Controlled Substance Act uh, and allow states that have hemp legislation to move forward with commercial production. Because um, right now, hemp is not defined under the Controlled Substance Act, it's marijuana, basically. Oh. So, finally, with the Farm Bill, hemp is at the federal level defined as something, but that's just for research. And so the Industrial Hemp Farming Act would get that cleared up. Hmm. So perhaps I could grow marijuana, or not marijuana, but hemp through the University of Wisconsin system, perhaps, as a project? Is that open to students, I would imagine? Yeah, you could um, check with the university and start kind of doing some research of folks that could be interested in, in pursuing a project, and that would be working with the State Department of Agriculture nice. in Wisconsin, and they would have to implement some sort of kind of framework to make that happen. I, I also know that the market is what will drive this. Mm -hmm. So one of the reasons, I believe, why Kentucky got on the bandwagon was it was pretty well laid out that tobacco and cotton were done in the state mm. and that the hemp would fight or remediate their soil and they could start growing for the big the autom automobile industry mm. that's already in doing well up and down the East Coast so they don't have far to ship. 
And I don't know about the processing plants or whatever they got, but they certainly were the king, so to speak, of hemp. Lexington was the hub for uh, hemp in back in the day. <laughs> so you're kind of people are trying to go back to what, you know, it, all I, I, I'll just stay with this. It's the market. It will be driven by the market. Yeah, and that's what the California Department of Food and Agriculture said to the Hemp Industries Association when they met with them a month ago. They said that they would be open to research happening, but the hemp industry will have to pay for it. Hmm. So, pay for what? For research to happen. But the universities, the university representatives that attended that meeting with the CDFA and also the CDFA, they're like, yeah, you know, we'd probably be okay with it, but you guys are going to have to pay for it. <laughs> Basically, like, there's no budget. Um, yeah, that's that's kind of a challenging part. Um, but the hemp industry, just, you know, your question, Michael, about just an overview of the hemp industry, it's definitely come a long way since. Um, 1998, which was kind of a watershed moment um, where Canada legalized it, and they went the route of health food and nutrition through the oil and um, the seed as well as body care. And so that has been the foundation of the hemp industry to grow to where it is now. Um, It's over about $620 million last year um, in annual sales and imports of hemp products in the U.S., Um, the fiber industry is still pretty small, and most of it's coming from China and France and Romania um, imports for the, the textiles and different things. Um, but yeah, the hemp health food industry and body care has really been moving it along. That's brought a lot of awareness to farmers in the U.S. and, and different people that want to see it grown here as well. Do you know of any uh, problems Canada may be having with the process? I mean, are they? How do they get their seed to begin with? China, perhaps, or? Um, well, originally they went, for example, in Manitoba, which is the prairies right above North Dakota. They went out to the Ukraine and they got uh, genetics from there, and then they started their breeding programs. And also, they did some varieties from Finland. One of the popular one is called Sonola. Um, and that's an oil seed variety. Okay. And they just kind of started breeding shorter um, hemp varieties and started developing cultivars and like pedigree, basically like certified seed. Um, and they're very particular about who they give those genetics to in the U.S. Mm. Um, it's not very easy to get a hold of hemp seed to plant in the ground right now. Right. Um, yeah, they, they've had no problems. It's very regulated. It's the most regulated crop. Um, it's a very kind of bureaucratic thing because it is related to marijuana. They kind of treat it like a potential crime scene where every single hip to it has to be GPS coordinates. The farmer has to pass the background check. Every field gets tested to make sure the THC levels are within the appropriate level, which is 0.3% maximum THC, but often it's way less than that. Um, so, and it's interesting because even though Canada is one of the countries that grows the most hemp, if you compare hemp to the other crops, it's about less than 1% of total acreage in Canada is hemp. So it's right. still really small, uh, but it's growing. It was like over 68,000 acres last growing season. Farmers like it. It helps break disease cycles on the farm. They notice that it, it benefits and they get about two hundred to four hundred dollars an acre for certified hemp grain, which is like the final product grain. Mm. Um, and if you compare that to corn or soy, they get about one hundred and sixty an acre in the U.S. for corn or soy. So hemp definitely, you know, has a higher um, price that the farmers will get, but they have to have a contracted buyer. That's one thing too with hemp. Okay. In the future, farmers have to be careful that they have someone that is going to buy their crops from them. Okay. Huh. Well, you've got companies like Nutiva here in California with, who buys a lot of their seed from Canada, and they're having a hard time keeping up with consumer demand for huh. organic hemp seed. 
because of the reasons Anna gave you and the fact that a lot of land is already dedicated to other oils rather than the hemp. Maybe there's some change going on where they're, they're going to start reducing like the canola fields and start putting hemp in because canola is uh, probably not the best oil there is. And hemp, because it's so high in omega-3s and omega-6s, etc., you know, it has a, a higher value. And so, once again, it's driven by the market. When people start to become more educated and start realizing that if they have a choice and they can get this or that for pretty much the same amount of money, and this will be more beneficial to their health, and it's not going to taste terrible, it will taste just fine, then they're going to go for that. And so, this is all part of what Hempstead does with how we educate people, because we are an educational nonprofit. I'm making smart choices that make sense. Yep. Well, that, that is one of the most important things with the market-driven economy is having accurate information so the consumer can make good choices. And that, um, yeah. Hmm. Absolutely. And so for somebody, for a company like Nutiva, having a hard time supplying their, their customers with the heat, they have speed because they can't find, they can't keep it up because they can't find the organic seeds to make their oils and their, their uh, et cetera, from. That's, that's an interesting problem to have, especially with the United States still lagging behind rather than picking it up and saying, woohoo, boy, you've got the cheap here it is. It clearly shows that you are, uh, you know, you're a small company that you gone through the roof in sales of this product, we could create jobs just by building the processing plants in and of themselves, you know, putting farmers to work rather than having their fields lie fallow, you know, lie empty, you know, that they can actually start growing a product that's going to pay them, you know, how many small farms do we lose every, every day? Right. That, so... And I really think, too, and I, I'm not alone, I know that Anna does, too, that, um, uh, that boutique farming is, is, uh, is a niche market in and of itself. I mean, if you were to compare the farms growing for McDonald's as opposed to the, to the organic farms growing for Whole Foods, etc., you will find that the smaller farmers are spending less money on pesticides because the hemp doesn't need those pesticides and organic don't either, so they're saving money, and they're saving their seeds because, once again, if the seed becomes GMO, then you're dependent upon Roundup, etc. So we're not just talking about simple stuff here. We're talking about a very complex system in place that we're basically here, in, in a sense, breaking the chain. And so hemp is a big, strong component in the uh, chain, the chain-breaking element of things, where you're bringing it home and you're making a, a collective for small farmers who are actually making a living and healing the soil and creating products that are good for our health. Do you have any uh, recommendations uh, in terms of trying to keep it in more of a cooperative family farm kind of style versus, you know, is big industry just going to come in and uh, sweep up on all this? or It depends on the farmer, what the farmers are saying, too. You know, educating the farmers. What do you say, Anna? Some states have minimum acreage required for a license. I think it might be 10 acres in California um, for commercial some states it's more. So it might be a good idea for farmers to consider going in on combining their license together maybe mm -hmm. so that way they can, um, as they're building their seed or working to develop, they don't have to stretch themselves so far, like right away. They can partner with other farmers. I think that would be really smart as we're slowly building the industry. And then also, like, getting involved in the legislative process to, for example, allow farmers to be able to save some of their seed. Because some of the stipulation when, I think in, in uh, Oregon, you should double check, I don't, I want to make sure this is accurate, but my understanding in Oregon is that farmers purchase 
see through certain Canadian companies that they are not allowed to keep their seed. It's confusing whether or not it's for commercial or research. Like, if you're growing hemp for research, you won't be able to save your seed because it's not a commercial grow. Um, so it just, I think my, my advice um, is that farmers should really um, be, try to get involved with the legislative process or have representatives um, that can provide accurate information because it varies from state to state. And honestly, like, I'm not completely aware of every detail in Oregon because there's so many things going on nationwide. Um, but I do want to introduce to you my gold a guy named Chris. And he's in Oregon. He has um, a company called Oregon Hempsport. Great. And he is really active uh, in what's going on out there. So he can answer more specific questions probably or help point you in the direction to get more detailed awesome. questions answered. Awesome. Yeah, I think you're on Facebook. I think I found you. Do you have a beard? Yep, yep. That's <laughs> okay, cool. So I will, I will message you Chris's info so you can connect with him. Cool. Awesome. Yeah, he's in Oregon City. Okay, We're just down the road here, not too far. Is there any other thing you ladies would like to add to all this? I appreciate you taking some time with me here. and It's been very informational. appreciate that. Um, oh. Yeah, I'll send you some links to a couple people in Oregon that you should connect with. One of them's Chris, and another one, her name's Courtney, and there is a Hemp Industries Association chapter in Oregon. Um, and so these are some of the people that are really active and, and know what's going on out there. And it'd be really great, too, if you could share with me what's going on so I can understand, too, like keeping me in the loop um, about commercial versus research production, because I'm a little confused about how that's going down in Oregon. Okay. Um, but I know Edgar Winters is the name of the farmer, and I think he's near Eugene area, southern Oregon. Um, cool. So, okay. yeah, I'll send you some info. There's also really good reports that you can read, like there's the CRS report, the Congressional Research Service report, okay. um, really legitimate. And uh, there's also National Industrial Hemp Strategy out of Canada. Um, I wrote a work uh, research paper at Humboldt, and there's a lot of good quotes from farmers and stuff in there. It kind of gives an overview of different interviews that I did. Um, Great. Awesome. So, yeah. Awesome. Yeah. All right. Go cool. And uh, please like our page if you haven't already, our Hempstead Project Heart page. Okay. So like our Hempstead Project Heart page and tell your friends about it. And we also have these wonderful t-shirts that we promote through our website. That was the, the t-shirts were designed by John Trudell, and it caught the, the t-shirt says, Think More, Believe Less. Awesome. And it is a hemp t-shirt, and uh, they look great. They help to support us, because the whole point of, of us having this, I want to say, it's the whole point of, of Hempstead is to do what we're doing with you today. Awesome. So we're uh, constantly looking for uh, people who are willing and wanting to support us by, uh, we're going to be having more products too, we'll be having calendars and, uh, with, uh, and work from John to uh, Todd, that sort of thing. But that's small change. What we're really looking forward to is to really getting this movement going. And Hempstead has been doing this for the last couple of years, and we're really spearheading a lot of change. And so we're very diverse. There's a third person who's part of our group. Her name is Leah Walters. She's also a total advocate. She refers to herself as a solutionary nice. to uh, as hemp as being earth medicine and the total solution to uh, all our many of our ills and woes. I'm sending you some stuff on Facebook for people that you connect with in Oregon. Awesome. And you can just let them know Anna Owens and along their info to share. Cool. And they, I'm sure they'll be really happy to talk to you. Cool. Awesome. And if you see John, tell him hello for me. I'd like to chat with him again sometime. So. He's a, he's a South by Southwest. Oh, very nice. The band is performing on, yeah, the band is performing on uh, Saturday. Awesome. Yeah. 
Awesome. Which is a good day for fun. Yes. So you're, what you're researching now, what we're talking with you now, is to help you on a paper that you're writing? Yes. You're laying the base for, I'll probably put together a survey based on this interview, just to, for one, to maybe gauge where the average person's at with hemp awareness. And basically, yeah. just, this is like the seed to this whole project was this conversation. So I, I really appreciate that. Yeah, and um, Michael, feel free once you draft it to send it to me, and I can provide feedback for you. Cool. And you can like check it out and offer suggestions. Yeah, I totally. If you ever want me to edit anything or check anything out, I'm more than happy to help you out. So cool. Here's the question: How do you become a hemp farmer? Or how do you become a hemp farmer? How do you become a hemp farmer? Well, it helps to have knowledge, a good foundation in farming. Specifically, we like to reach out to farmers that are doing um, sustainable practices. But yeah, talking to other farmers that have experience with hemp, researching hemp in different rotations and different processing techniques and, pro and having an idea of what you want to grow the crop for. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of farmers that are already doing their thing, you know, incorporating hemp is a great crop to incorporate, but if you really want to hone in on hemp, it'd be a good idea to look at what other rotations that you want to do with it as well. Okay. All right. Well, you'd have to see what would grow best in your area, you know, mm -hmm. is it best for you to be growing it for oil or for fibers, or there are other farmers who are doing that too. Um, having, I would think, that if you're a member of a grange, a local grange, mm. that you would bring it up at your grange hall and, and see, you know, test the water that way. Join a grange, absolutely. If you've got a grange in your area, join it. Uh, the granges are having a resurgence right now. And so there's a lot of people talking about, uh, you know, now that, that uh, GMO products have kind of been, had a I had a hold a grip on American farmers and that a lot of farmers can't afford to stay in the market based on that. Oh. So there are farmers that are going looking into organic farming and uh, and what that would look like and what would be the crop that would pay the bills and not just pay the bills but would help them to thrive. So oh. if uh, health is a possibility in your area how would they be able to do it if there isn't a processing plan? You know, would this be, and farmers are long-term people, so this isn't just like an overnight thing. If a farmer's actually going to do it as a crop that they're going to hand down to their son or their daughter or whatever, you know, you're going to look at in your area and see how you're going to get this thing done in a way that the market will support. So um, I'm sure those conversations are going on in Kentucky right now, and I'm using Kentucky as an example because that, you know, tobacco and cotton trashed. So you know, they have to change things around. And maybe they're retooling those, those plants that were tooling leaves, that were processing tobacco leaves to put, you know, to make, to make into, uh, into cigarettes. You know, so I, I don't, I don't know. I don't know enough about that. I'm just surmising that's a probability. But really, you're going to look at it like, how are we going to get this to the market? Who's the market going to be? And if it's going to be hemp oil, then you may have a company like Nutiva. I think Trader Joe's is not going to start producing it. Whole Foods. There's a lot of people that are out there waiting. So they just have to be made aware that hemp is a, a good possibility for them. Awesome. And so how do you get, how do, and, and those are the things, if I was a farmer, those are the best music for my ears, you know, <laughs> that I'm going to save my soil, you know, that I'm going to save money on fertilizer, I'm not going to be beholden to a company like Monsanto who's going to sue me. Uh, if I grow a field and they find my their seeds on my, my I want to get out from under that rain that rain of terror. So uh, you know you, you you appeal to these people in this way. It isn't just stars and sets. It's like more than that. It's like you know just more than that. It's the ground on which you stand that that considers considered sacred ground. 
army needed to interact, and thank God, it was self armed, you know, no harm, no food. So, yeah, that's, that's how I would definitely talk to farmers, dollars and cents. And just like to go off of what Linda's saying, it is important for the farmer to have buyers lined up to be able to work. That's why the cooperative model is really probably a good way to go. That way you have different businesses in alignment with the farmers. That way right. they know that they can get a buyer. And that's going to be really important, too. Cool. Yeah. And they know that. They know that, too. But if they don't know that they have to, they don't know what they don't know. You know? <laughs> right. And that's where it's like, how do you get them to know? You know, how do you get, like, bring that to their attention? Because, you know, I bet you a lot of farmers will say, hey, my grandpa used to grow hemp. Or, yeah, my granddaddy, whatever, you know, or my father. But, but you know, when I, I had no idea because I'm not from a farming background, not even close. And so since we've been doing our Hempstead uh, uh, events, and we talk to all kinds of people. Hundreds of people come through our booth. And a lot of people joke and can smell dirt and this and that. But when it gets right down to it, people are, it's always the same. Yeah, I, it's, I knew somebody, my grandfather, my uncle, my cousin, you know, my father, whatever. You know, they all had a relationship. And it's, it's not, it's closer than six degrees of separation. It's a lot closer. The people, it's in there but they haven't had a chance or a reason to talk about it. So I really think that there's more of a groundswell that we realize, and there's more of, like, American thinking of ourselves as being individualist. It's, it's a way of appealing to people that we can get that back. And so if you have that market, if you know that there's a market, you, you start looking like what we have in our booth, and they're saying, this is made from hemp? You're kidding. We have, you have a snowboard that's made nice. of hemp? That's a hemp plastic kitchen sink. You're telling me that we can we can grow hemp and create our own plastic? Are you serious? Right. This is what people, they get them excited, they get them motivated, and then they're like, yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> this, 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 is, this is the truth. This is the human we're talking about. We're talking about humanity and a way for us to get behind something that is going to uh, bring us home, basically. Bring it back yeah. home. Awesome. Cool, you guys. That's what I said. Why better get going? Again, I thank you. Thank you. Appreciate that. Okay, thanks so much, you guys. Cool. Well, talk to you soon. Bye, see you later. Watch it.